really do love Mike Littlewood. He's, he's the best. He's so good looking, right? He's the best. Oh, trust me. Talk to my wife. Yeah, Brittany my, my wife's too. Big fan. <laughs> yeah, big, big fan of the baseball team. I'm like, why, why are you always watching the BYU baseball game? Why is your crush on the baseball coach so public? Wow, it's so weird. And we just brought it up. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Interviews and insight from this week in Cougar Sports. Every Saturday, only on BYU Radio. To lead off, here's the double coverage interview of the week. We presented the top five power couples of BYU athletics yesterday, current athletes. Now we present an all-time power couple at BYU, former Cougar football star and NFL defensive back Derwin Gray and his valedictorian lovely wife, Vicky, both joining us now on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. It's great to have both of you on the show. How are you today? Uh, we are we are doing great. It's it's like walking down uh, memory lane for us, and so it's uh, it's beautiful. Vicky got to talk to some uh, some jab throwers yeah. yesterday, and because uh, she threw the jab on that, that was one of the things that attracted me to her. Is I was like, not only she's beautiful, but she could kill me at the same time. It was, <laughs> it was just incredibly intoxicating, man. Um, so it was awesome. But yeah. we are so thankful for. Uh, Tom and Liz and just the BYU community allowing us to come back and share uh, with the athletes. And, and what we're doing here is we are, we are trying to be a part of what does it look like to root out racism? And, and on the face of it, um, that seems like a simple question, but always below and underneath there are things that are lurking. And so what we want to try to do, is to help create a context and an environment where all people feel welcome and love. And so we've been meeting with various groups and, and our biggest theme is this conversation needs to be rooted and take place in the person of Jesus Christ. So I've been sharing the story of the good Samaritan and how a Samaritan was not supposed to be the hero of that story because Jews and Gentiles in the first century world had ethnic conflict. Like, like it was deep, Mm -hmm. But yet Jesus tells this story where an unlikely person exhibits unlikely love to someone that's supposed to be an enemy. And what we got to understand is at the end of the day, rooting out racism becomes love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, the key, though, is, is this is oftentimes when we are in bubbles of sameness, we begin to think that everybody's like us. And the reality is God loves an array of people. God loves diversity. You see it in creation. You see it even within the human race, various ethnicities. And we miss out on God's beauty when we cut out other voices. And one of the illustrations that I gave that I think really connected was this. So in elementary school, uh, most people wrote on a right-handed desk, right? Even if you were left-handed, you wrote on a right-handed desk. For us who were right-handed, it was great. But for those who were left-handed, it was not great. So for those who were right-handed, we had right privilege, Doesn't mean we didn't work hard. It just meant the desk was made for us. Left-handed people worked even harder because the desk wasn't made for them. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes we see the world from, well, doesn't everybody have a right hand? No, there are people with left hands. And love says, let's go make more left-handed desk Mm -hmm. so that left-handed people can recognize that left-handed people lives matter too. Yeah. And, you know, the other aspect, I think probably what we've spent a lot of time communicating, especially to the support staff, which, by the way, the athletic student athlete support system that BYU has now is so incredible. We've just been really impressed, very encouraged, like really just top notch quality leadership, um, people of character. It's been really, really encouraging, but probably my biggest message that I've just been trying to help them see is 
you may not be able to fix problems that your student athletes are experiencing, but the most important thing you can do is journey with them, be an ally. Don't dismiss their experiences just because you've not experienced it. Don't dismiss something they may have experienced. Do your best to go to bat for them, but let them know that you're on their side. And it really means a world of difference to somebody who, and and myself, I'm, actually considered a minority when I was at BYU because I'm non-LDS. And so um, my coach, the head track coach at the time, Craig Poole, who's like a legend in BYU track and field, right? Um, He always made me feel like he was on my side. Mm -hmm. And regardless, he loved me unconditionally. And so I knew I had an ally in him and I knew I could go to him and he would be supportive of me. Yeah. You both talked about uh, how impressed you've been with the current state of the athletic support program, yet there are still challenges remaining. So where, where do we start to combat those challenges as we unite together and try and root out racism? Yeah, you, you know, so, so um, as we have talked to student athletes, as we've, as we've talked to the support staff, is how do you bridge the gap b- between um, school faculty, administration, um, the lack of sometimes of cross-cultural currency because the athletes feel safer in their athletic um, teams. Mm -hmm. So how do you translate that to the classroom to when you um, are not around the athletes? And and so we've talked about uh, making connections where athletes and administrators and teachers have meetings and connection points where it's not based on class, but just to get to know another human being, right? Um, Also um, looking at strategic ways to create cross-cultural learning, cross-cultural competency. And at the end of the day, love is sacrificial. Am I willing to love you enough to learn about you and what you've experienced and your culture? Um, That's what love does. And and so as a model and as an example, so when, when Jesus comes to earth, he was not affected by sin, right? So he's like perfect. He's sinless. Us, humanity was affected by sin and his incarnation is God saying, I want to learn about you. I, I want to see what you're experiencing because that's what love does. Love goes into your place of pain and bring healing. Love says, I want to hear your story. I mean, Jesus, the woman at the well in history between Jews and Gentiles, a Jewish rabbi should have never gone to Samaria, let alone to meet a woman at the well. And what does he do? Hey, can I have a drink from you? In Jewish culture, that is unheard of. But yet God is saying, I'm going to show you another way. So so we need to pay more attention to Jesus. Right. Like we need to really listen to his words. And when he challenges us on our presuppositions, when he challenges us on our prejudices, when he challenges us on our stereotypes, we need to bow a knee to him and say your way is the best way. Hey, amen to that. Hey, amen. Literal and figurative. Amen. Um, It's Black History Month. (laughs) Um, how important is it for Cougar Nation to to learn more about it? And obviously, the movement during the summer uh, certainly influential, and, and it's way more relevant than it's ever been, especially in, in other white communities. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that's really important is it, it's a great opportunity, right, for us to learn more about black history. And I'll give you an example. We learned um, just the other day that the founder of the city of Chicago was an African-American. Like, why did we not know that? Right. There's so many like there was a great lawman of the West who was African-American. There's all these things we're just now learning that we're like, wow, we've never really celebrated um, heroes of the African-American faith, except for maybe Martin Luther King Jr. or Rosa Parks. And so I think learning those things is really, really important. I think the caution is let's not make it only February every year. Like, let's make this conversation conversation normative that we are celebrating um, people of all color in all areas. And so it can tend to be, oh, this is the month where we have the African-American speaker come. That's something that we've experienced. And quite frankly,
frankly, sometimes I'll be like, no, he's not going in February. Um, and I really, listen to her. <laughs> just to make a point. To say, he's, there's 11 other months he can speak. <laughs> I, I was a javelin thrower. So, um, but no, I'm like, there's 11 other months he can speak. <laughs> Derwin and Vicky so you Gray. Can, so, 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 like, you guys think I'm the tough one. Like, I keep her out of jail. You guys just need to understand that. Derwin and Vicky Gray with us on BYU Sports Nation. Always working for each other for the greater good in relationships and certainly in matters of racism. Um, I do want to ask about the emotional connection that both of you have had with the student athletes. Take us inside the rooms and give us an idea of the feeling that you have had, both of you, as you have talked with these student athletes and how they've been receptive to this message. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, um, uh, both of us deeply care about BYU because our lives were impacted here. And so as you're looking at these young men, young w- women, is, is, is you see yourself and you also see who they can become. Uh, you also see the treasure that's in them and you want to bring that um, um, out of them. And so the emotional connection has been cool because a lot of them um, I've been following them since they got their first offers from BYU. Like I've known Chaz, like I've been talking to Chaz since he was a sophomore in high school. Like, like I've been talking to Jaron since he was a sophomore in high school. Um, I remember when, uh, when, uh, what what they call him a uh, psycho T, you know, was this walk on dude that nobody knew what position he was going to play. We, we went to church together. He was humble. Next thing I know, dude got 1100 yards about to go to the NFL. And like, we appreciate that they honored us. Um, there was a non mandatory meeting, for the black student athletes to meet us like it's seven o'clock at night. And I know they got to be tired. I mean, it's very grueling being a student athlete. And I thought maybe three or four kids would, would come. I mean, it was utterly packed and they are number, number, number one, intelligent. Number two, they are deep thinkers about life and why they're here. Uh, I was impressed with their level of maturity Um, I was impressed with their patience, but also uh, my heart hurt for some of the experiences that they have had. And I think that's why cross-cultural competency is so important. And when I use that word cross-cultural competency, what I mean is having the patience and love to learn the story of another. That is one of the most precious gifts you can give another human being is I want to know your story. And as you learn their story, uh, proximity breeds intimacy and intimacy is into me. You see, and what we're trying to share with the students is as a minority. And sometimes as a double minority, not only are you receiving from BYU, but we would like to believe that as none LDS that we have brought gifts to BYU as well, that we have made BYU better as well. And so what I was saying to them is, man, when I first got here, I had a, my freshman year, I had a 1.41 GPA. Now I write books. I'm writing a book. Now I speak around the world and uh, I was a compulsive stutterer. So imagine what, what you can do. Like there's greatness in you. uh, But we want to advocate on their behalf that, If you want things to change, you got to knock on the door and keep knocking until you knock it down. Well, we love and appreciate both of you. And uh, the message that you bring is one that is so important. So thank you for taking time out of your very busy personal lives to fly to Provo, to meet with the student athletes, and uh, frankly, to give all of BYU Sports Nation this message. Uh, We can't uh, thank you enough. So we appreciate the time. And uh, yeah, we uh, we send our love to you. Thank you all. Derwin and Vicki Gray with us on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Deseret First, you know why we show how. What a great message, right, that we all need. And uh, like I've been saying for a couple weeks, there's a place for everybody at BYU. I think there's a stigma that it's like white members of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. No, 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 no. There's a place for Vicki. There's a place for Derwin. There's a place for everybody. And, uh, you know, like on the men's volleyball team, I love it. It's very international. A lot of guys that aren't uh, from from, uh, the U.S. or even the church. There's a kid from Latvia. Uh, the kids who's Lebanese now, I'm like, this is great because this place has something to offer for everyone. Yes, Davide and Gabi. And I mean, there are so many. There's a Latvian kid as well. Like, let's go. 
Yeah. This can be a great place for that. I, I love it I so much. Absolutely love and it. And I love that he referenced Tyler Algier as well. Yeah, Psycho T. Psycho T. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, awesome. The double minority is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a unique thing at BYU, yeah. so it's great to see that uh, that communication happening. That was one of our favorite interviews this week. You're listening to the best of BYU Sports Nation. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. We are currently discussing the big board from NFL draft scout Matt Miller, who released his top 300 players. Jeremy, and listen to this. Zach Wilson, according to Matt Miller, who is a respected NFL draft scout, the 11th best player overall, third best quarterback. We just put up a graphic a few minutes ago showing Zach essentially as the second quarterback drafted from everybody else, whether it be to the New York Jets at number two or to the Falcons at number four. Then in comes Matt Miller. So is it that the most surprising ranking, or is it his buddy Dax Milne at the 27th best receiver, Brady Christensen, 13th best offensive tackle, Tristan Hodge, interior offensive lineman, 17th best there, Kyrus Tonga, number 18, Chris Wilcox, the 36th best cornerback, or Matt Bushman not ranked at all? Which of those jumps off the page most to you? Uh, it's the fact that Tristan Hodge is probably on the radar, uh, which is great. The top 17, that's awesome. Brady Christensen, PFF keeps screaming that he's like one of the best number guys. Number one! Yet we're not seeing that translate into you know a position um, you know high up, 13 for Brady, so... That's probably like a third or fourth rounder kind of guy, which is totally fine. I would love for him to sneak into the second. I, th- I think that'd be great. Who had Chris Wilcox as a top 36 corner? I-, I think that's awesome. And we've been told, I mean, even his freshman year, we were told, hey, he's got some NFL talent. We were like, oh, that's quite a statement. That's pretty, mm-hmm. that's pretty bold. Kind of Michael Davis vibes there a little bit, right? He reminds me of Michael Davis. Like, not crazy flashy, not picking off a ton of passes. But, but fast yes. and long can cover. and super athletic. He can cover, man. He, yes. he opted out of the bowl game because he wanted to prepare because he knows he's, he's got a shot. Matt Bushman not ranked. Sticks out a little bit, too. That one's a shocker to me. Off the radar because he's hurt. That makes sense. And people aren't going to remember a ton of what he did. Like Matt never had that real statistically dominant season. Of course, he has great hands. There are some metrics that quantify like, oh, he had like no drops or whatever two years ago. But in terms of he didn't have like a 800 yard season or a, even a you know a 700 yard I don't think led BYU for three years but BYU did not pass the ball very well individually to those receivers so yeah it's great to have like six or seven dudes in the mix so I like this we don't have Isaiah Kafusi on there we don't have Troy Warner on there those guys are probably undrafted guys but I think they'll uh, they'll get a shot in the NFL imagine if Honey Hands Matt Bushman had such a funny name. something close to <laughs> what Isaac Rex had let's say Matt Bushman had nine or ten touchdown catches yeah, massive number then he would be a day two guy he'd be like oh he's a third round draft pick yeah Matt Bushman reliable yeah. great hands. Another great BYU tight end. BYU's got good history there with Dennis Pitta and Chad Lewis. Hello, Jerem. Because he Hello, didn't Dennis. play, he's just lost. Yeah, for sure. He just so I feel like Matt Bushman in a way has an opportunity to do kind of like a Wani Unga thing, where it's like injury late in the career, but you go and you impress, you get picked up as an undrafted free agent. But I think Matt will have more staying power than Wani. Like, he won't play just, you know, a season or two. I think Matt could be the guy that lasts in the NFL for six or seven years. That'd be awesome because Matt Bushman has some Travis Kelsey attributes. Like, he can get open. He's a big target. Great hands. How well can he block is going to be a question you'll have to answer at the next level. But, it's yeah, Zach Wilson, we kind of know what he is, right? And, and it's the second or third quarterback taken. And if he's the 11th best overall and falls down in that area and ends up with Carolina or San Francisco? Well, that doesn't necessarily translate right. to what, picks. What right? do teams need? Yeah, yes, because when we look at the NFL draft, tell me, do, does this team need a quarterback? Jaguars? Yes. Yep. Jets? Yes. Yep. Dolphins? No. Mm. Uh, Falcons? Yep. Yes. Bengals? No. Eagles? No, they're probably on, not. They're on Jalen Hurts. Lions? No, now with Jared Goff. Mm-hmm. Uh, Panthers? Yep. Yes, they're not long term on on Teddy Bridgewater. It looks like Broncos. Yep. Yes, that's one we've not talked about. If he slides, Broncos could pick him. Could just be over them mountains. Well, I'm seeing a bunch of Denver fans chime in recently on social media saying, "Trade up and get the kid from BYU." They like him. They're not in on Drew Locke, right? They gave him oh. kind of a year and a half. Uh, Cowboys? No. Giants. They're probably going to stick it out with mm-hmm. Daniel Jones another mm-hmm. year or two. 
And then Niners. Yeah, I, I agree with Blaine. I don't see any way, any way that Zach drops past 12. Now, some of these teams could opt. Like, the Jets could say, listen, we are bringing Sam Darnold back, and we're going to give him another year. It's a new staff. Hey, maybe they come in and they say, we like Sam. Let's see what we can do with him. And they take Penny Sewell, left tackle from Oregon, uh, you know, out of Southern Utah, by the way. Um, so, yeah, I, it's not necessarily going to be quarterback, quarterback, quarterback. There's going to be some surprises in that. But I'd be shocked if Zach falls out of the top 10, sure. let alone to 12. Based on those team needs, those quarterback yes. needs. And who jumps up that really, really likes him. I don't see a Julio Jones or Mitch Trubisky situation where you're selling the farm to go get Zach. But maybe, who knows? Like, like uh, when you're in love, you get desperate. And if a team's <laughs> in love with Zach, hey, let's go. Dax Milne is the 27th best wide receiver. Are there going to be 27 wide receivers drafted in the 200 and whatever picks there, or 262 and, and picks? Yeah, again, one of my principles, right? Beware the one guy saying the one thing. So, it's, hey, he's the 27. One team may say, the Patriots might be like, dude, you're the next Julian Edelman for us. Or 190th you know I mean? overall. So that would, just by the number <laughs> alone, Jeremy would have Dax going in like, the fifth or sixth round. Oh, he, he said his goal was fourth. So that'd be great. If Dax Milne is drafted, that's tremendous. That's great. Think about where he came from. I mean, that's pretty awesome. Think of where all these guys came from. Being Tristan Hodge is the only guy that would make sense getting drafted because at a high school, he was the number one center in the country and signed with Notre Dame. Brady Christensen was a two-star underweight offensive lineman. Yep. That's a return missionary. Yep. Zach Wilson. Yeah. Him getting three to the star NFL? guy, three star didn't get an offer from the school that he grew up cheering for. Like the, the he couldn't get and a then, look. And then later told Boise Dave State. McCann, Blaine, and myself, "Hey, Utah doesn't develop the quarterbacks at the the level you know in hindsight that would have been wanted." So I don't know that mm. he would have gone to Utah anyway. Yeah, tells Boise State no, comes to BYU. Yeah, and Boise State has a couple of quarterbacks that have had a. a you know, a fling in the NFL. Kellen Moore, of course, was amazing at Boise State. OC for the Cowboys now. Baptized member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So whether he wants to be a BYU candidate or not, he will always be discussed <laughs> in that vein. And then, uh, you know, Rippin, Brett Rippon still in the NFL as a backup. I'm looking at these players. Man, I'm hopeful the BYU has four draft picks. Oh, that'd be great. That would be fantastic. To go from, like, one a year to none sometimes to having multiple. That's the f- those are the fruits of the labors of a great season. There's a reason that BYU's not had a ton of draft picks recently. It's because BYU's not done anything yeah. in a season. I think they will have three at minimum. Recently. Four would be fantastic. <sighs> Five feels like it's a stretch, but yeah, three would be amazing. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. We now turn our attention to BYU basketball assistant coach Cody Feger, who aspires to one day be a head coach. And frankly, Jerem, we both think that he will be. In fact, he was a serious contender at Utah Valley when Mark Pope left to come to BYU. Cougars, fortunate still to have him on staff in Provo. And his path here has included some unbelievable mentors. This is Deep Blue presented by America First Credit Union. We're here to help. I was the guy that's done every single job that there has been. I've done tickets, I've done travel, I've done every single part of college basketball. And then I've just kind of built myself up from there. You know, he worked under Rick Majerus, and anybody that knows Coach Majerus knows how demanding that position is. And he did it as a manager. From the first day I met him, you, you could see how hard of a worker he was to become a coach. Of all the qualities that Cody has, his integrity is, is beyond reproach. He's all in. That guy puts his heart and soul into coaching and making the team just a better program. He cares about the players. If you ask any any of the players on the team, they know how much that he loves them and cares for them and spends time for them. He can get on them. He can joke with them. He can challenge them. He can push them. And they trust him and they like being around him. I can tell he actually cares about you as a as a person, and he'll sit down and just talk to you. I mean, he won't even be about basketball sometimes. He just wants to see how you're doing. And stuff like that really just shows, like, okay, it's bigger than basketball. I mean, they don't really care about me just because I can help them win games. Like, they care about me as, as a person. And Coach Figure is a perfect example of that. He knows what each guy needs, and he is able to get that out of each of those players. He's able to know what to do 
in order for that player to respond and execute the way that he believes that player can, can play. You know, I told him my goal was to be a college coach at the end of the day and, you know, that we'd be traveling a ton and it would be hard on family sometimes just with how much I'd be gone. And, and I'm going to break here and say that no, he did not warn me <laughs> of any of these things. I was very I new to, to the sports world and I had no idea what I was getting into. I did know a little bit because he was gone all the time, but... I really enjoyed spending time with him and I got to hear about his passion and he had such a passion for basketball right from the get-go and a passion for all the players and the coaches and the things he was learning and he made really good friendships and relationships right away. So it was really fun to see. Whenever you talk about Coach Fieger, you got to start with his wife, Danielle, who is so extraordinary and really keeps him in check. Cody walks through the halls of the Marriott Center and the Annex and has all this respect from everybody. But I think he goes home and Danielle puts him in his place, which is really a gift. And then his children, Izzy and Drew and, and Anna, uh, his newborn, they spend a lot of time in and out of the office and they're fantastic. And the way that his family has been a part of this program is really exciting. Anna was supposed to be born in early November. Oh, yeah. I was taking a recruiting trip thought no big deal of it we were going to be back because usually every time she's had a baby it's been normally like right around the date or right after the recruiting trip was october 23rd and uh left early in the morning i turn on my phone and then i get a text from danielle saying hey just a heads up i'm going to the hospital right now obviously my panic starts to set in it was all happening in the middle of the night, and I have the two other kids at home, so I was lucky that I have a friend who lived close by who was willing to come help. And then I get on my second flight from New York to Salt Lake, and I'm just, you know, hoping the whole time everything's fine and nothing's going to happen until I got there. <laughs> well, I was about 30 minutes after Anna was born, and so Danielle was great with it. <laughs> To me, I'm sure she has other insight for you, but she's a trooper. She's tough as nails. <laughs> it's all very unknown territory for me. So I just, I want him to be happy and I want him to reach his goals and I'll help him however I can to get there. <laughs> My goal is to be a head coach in college, going to camps as a young kid and then you know, starting out with Coach Majerus at Utah, just the wins or losses or the relationships with players, competition, being with the team, all that stuff. It's something that, you know, I lo really look forward to, and I love the game of basketball. Cody Fieger, the deep blue feature BYU basketball assistant coach. And Mark Pope is right. He does command everyone's respect because of everything that he does and means to the program. He's Mr. Consistency. Yeah, he's personable, and uh, he's a player's coach. Uh, you always need a player's coach. You need someone that the players can go to and really have a conversation with. Ideally, it's everybody, but that, that's not always the case. And uh, people like him. You can, on Twitter, uh, yes. by the way, like 20K views, just awesome. Um, and frankly, I was a little surprised by that number with this story, which is awesome. It's more than I thought. I didn't even expect that much for Gideon. I thought it'd be like, okay, this one's going to explode, but I didn't think it would be like 80,000 views. Right. So you never know which one's going to land, and this one has landed as well. People can relate to Cody. And a lot of his former players have weighed in and said, yeah, he's awesome, love Cody, that kind of thing. Like Kyle Collinsworth, Skylar Halford, and those guys. Pretty cool to see that reaction. Well, Jake Toulson said, I've never heard him make an excuse except for when the Green Bay Packers lose. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. And there's a lot to talk about with BYU football, right? Zach Wilson in the draft, why he wasn't a captain initially, how good of a leader he is, who the starting quarterback will be this fall, spring balls around the corner, new hires on the offensive line and, okay. and uh, linebacker. So, right. yes, here's my conversation with Kalani Sataki on the Deseret First Credit Union hotline. 
All right, Kalani, it's just us talking. So uh, in 195 days, you're going you're gonna to play Arizona at Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas. Hopefully there's like 80,000 fans there. That would be awesome. So go ahead and just clear it up. Who's going to be the starting quarterback? Go ahead. Me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, the, the, the best one that wins a job will be uh, taking the snaps from center. And, uh, you know, the fortunate part for us is we have a bunch of guys that can do it. And I have a lot of confidence in all of them. So uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, someone will emerge by that time. Uh, until then, we're going to give them as much time as possible uh, to compete and, and win the spot. Now, sometimes, uh, you know, a winner of, of that is announced after spring ball, and then it gives the guys sort of the summer to rally around that guy and prepare. Do you think that this will go into fall camp, or do you plan on naming a guy after spring? Um, you know, I, I don't think we can uh, put a, a really a – uh, timeline to it. I, th- I think uh, having a deadline, uh, the most important deadline is by the time we get to, to the first game. Uh, I think um, once we kind of figure it out, then then we'll know. I, I think maybe creating a, the opportunity for uh, for it to be kind of more down to a two man race will probably be the deal when we get to, to camp. But even then, I, I can't predict it. I can't force the forecast it from now because uh, we want to give everyone an opportunity to to win the spot and. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of different things that go into it, which receivers are on the field, uh, the high level of, of veterans or experience that's blocking for them, uh, defense that they're going against. Uh, well, that's just us playing against ourselves. And so uh, we have to evaluate all that and then try to simulate a game type of um, uh, experience for them and see how they can uh, these, these quarterbacks can perform under some pressure. And uh, I think they're going to do really well, though, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Probably get get them to raise their level of play and, and make everyone better. Yeah, I think it's going to be fun as well. We didn't see Jaron Hall play and, and barely dress uh, for games during the season, yet he's not playing baseball, so it feels like he's all in on trying to get the starting job here. He is, and I think he took some time to, to recover and get healthy, and he's really good right now. So um, I think going into spring ball, we feel really good about his health and, and him being close to 100%. Um, his arm strength is there, and so it's going to be a really good competition with all, with all of them, and, and it's good to have them, all of them back and healthy and ready to roll. That's great news. Looking forward to it uh, coming up March 1st with spring ball. Speaking of quarterback, Zach Wilson and this crew of NFL prospects will provide a compelling pro day coming up in late March. What do you expect from that group that uh, certainly will provide multiple NFL guys? Well, I mean, I, I'm really excited about the guys and their opportunity. I'm glad that we're having a pro day, you know, and, and, and um, I know that uh, it, Zach probably wants to do everything. He wants to run, jump, and do everything, but I think the key is going to be him throwing the ball. But I, I think having our other, other players get a chance in the pro day to, to show, showcase themselves and, and, and have an opportunity to go play the next level. I think we have a lot of guys in this class that, that, that will be in NFL squads. And I think there's a lot of guys that are, you know, are underclassmen on our team returning that are going to go to the NFL as well and have that opportunity. So it's always good for the young guys to see uh, these outgoing seniors and, and underclassmen that have declared get their opportunity to play. And, and I'm just really excited for all of them. And I think Zach will bring a lot of attention. But it's not just Zach. You're looking at the three guys that declared early. Um, you know, they're, they're going to bring some attention. But there's a lot of guys that, that are in the mix that are kind of on the bubble of a draft pick to a free agent. And uh, that's a good place for our guys to be in. And and it shows a lot of the improvement and the things that we've done as a program to develop these young men into the the caliber athletes that they are right now. Yeah, win and get noticed. And Zach Wilson, Kalani, has a chance to be the highest draft pick in BYU history, which is just incredible. If he goes top four, he is. He's being talked about as high as two. What's that like for you to sit here and go, man, a couple years ago, we changed the offensive staff. We went and got Zach real quick. Um, he came, and then here we are talking about him maybe being a top five pick. Yeah, I mean, I know this sounds crazy, but I, I, I think we have a lot of guys that can have that type of year, and and um, it only it only takes a year, you know, to, right. to make your mark. I mean, Joe Burrows uh, proved that, Kyler Murray did it as well, and so I, I think um, Zach was the next one to, to step up and do it, and I think it, it gives a lot of hope and excitement for the rest of the guys that are playing on our team that. You guys, that, that I mean, not a lot of people were talking about Dax uh, last year, and 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 now he's a possible draft pick. And Brady Christensen's got a lot of uh, attention. And so there's a lot of guys on this team that I feel can make it there, make it to the league. And uh, but I'm just really, really proud to be their coach, man. Just happy that they're they're starting to develop and perform 
the best of their their abilities, and and they're starting to find some even some hidden talents that they didn't think they had before. And a lot is their work ethic and their ability to get uncomfortable and find ways to grow and progress. One great year is exactly right. We're talking with Kalani Satake, the head coach of the BYU football team here on BYU Sports Nation. You've added a couple of guys to the staff with Jeff Grimes and Eric Mateos going to Baylor, which will be fun to match up with them this season, by the way. Uh, and Daryl Funk uh, on the offensive line and Kevin Clune at linebackers coach. What kind of impact have you seen from those guys already as you ramp it up for spring ball here in a couple of weeks? Well, just like what we thought they would be is a great connection to their players. Uh, I think Daryl's done a great job connecting with all the old linemen. And I think they're, they're going to be a, a really good group for us, that we need the O-line to be functioning well in order to have time for the quarterbacks to compete and get the best one on the field. Uh, but, you know, I've been really pleased with, with his presence. brings a lot of uh, energy, but he brings a lot of experience that uh, I think will be valuable to that room and valuable to A-Rod as an offensive coordinator. And then Kevin clune has been around. He was here last year as, as a volunteer Um and, and now, you know, he's, he's here, hired. We hired him. He's got tons of experience as well, uh, calling plays on defense and, and uh, being a coordinator. And so I've known him for a long time. Maybe I've worked with him when he was in Southern Utah. And then seeing him uh, coordinate a lot of different schools, uh, I think it's, been, it's going to be valuable for us. And I think both those guys bring tons of experience and value to, to the offensive and defensive staff. And uh, I think it will make us a lot better and get our, our guys to perform better in each of the position groups and, and keep things rolling just like we had in 2020. Spring ball coming up uh, in a couple of weeks here. What do you hope to accomplish other than develop the quarterbacks? Yeah, develop everybody. Yeah, and, and just have great competition. Uh, you know, we're going to have to just play a lot of football. And in order to find the best quarterback, we have to play a lot of 11-on-11 11 11 football and, and um, probably take a break from the 11-on-11 by playing 7-on-7. Seven seven. So I see the quarterbacks throw the ball. But we need to see every position group um, improve and have uh, some of these younger guys that people haven't heard of allow them to get have an opportunity to perform and compete. And then I, I think we'll be able to develop a lot of depth. Uh, last year, we were able to get a lot of guys valuable reps in game time, uh, game time uh, situations and um, you know played a lot more reps than they've had in, in years past. And so I think we've got a deeper team, even though we've lost a lot of production. Um from last year, we, we return a lot of guys that have played in, in football games, and that's going to be huge for us going into this season in 2021. But it's going to be great for us going into spring ball as well with a lot of experience and veterans returning. And you returned some uh, return missionaries, uh, you know, led by Dallin Holker, uh, most notably who played as a freshman in 2018. We've talked about this a little bit before, and you've addressed it publicly where you've said, hey, ideally they kind of – develop for a year physically and then we throw them in so is your hope that you don't have to use a return missionary per se the year after their mission physically i think things are different now um even on missions you know where where the missionaries are are allowed to actually work out now and 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 do that daily i thought they did that the whole time kalani (laughs) i'm just kidding (laughs) but we asked some of the other schools i think that's all they do is work out and (laughs) get stronger but you know i think they made a change where missionaries could actually work out every day and get that hour in compared to when I went, it was only the, on P day that you could work out. And, and so I, I think the, the, the return to the field, it can be a lot quicker, especially if we're really smart with how we, when we bring them back and uh, we've been able to gray shirt some guys and kind of push them in, into, into the weight room and get, get that uh, transition back. And, and it's, it's sped up the process, kept them healthy uh, but for the, for these guys, uh, guys like Dallin Holker and others, I think they're going to come in just ready to roll. Uh, I anticipate them coming in ready to roll. And the, but there's other positions that will need guys that would need to be careful with their, with their um, transition from you know knocking on doors. Well, I don't even know if they can do that anymore. But from uh, proselyting to being a football player, and and so it's really individual when it comes down to it. Yeah, and I suppose it depends when they get home, too, because you have some guys that are already there working out, so they certainly have a better chance than the others, it, it would seem. Okay, you added South Florida two more years, so four games uh, you know, from 2019 to 23. What did you think of that extension? And were, are you hoping that Tom Brady shows up to the season opener next year in Tampa? I'm hoping we have some guys on that, on that team that they can show up, you know, so we'll, we'll see. I, 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 uh, I'm excited about that, that, that matchup. I know we, we want to play that game again especially out there. And so um, to have that opportunity to play them, I mean, they're a good team. And, and, 
I think we've got a, a win streak started in Florida now, and we can build on it. That's right. That's right. The first win in Florida in program history. That was a big one in the bowl game over uh, UCF. Okay, it's been a couple months since 2020, and it's about you know two or so since the bowl game. What's been some of your takeaways from the magical season that was 2020? So I've seen a lot of progress as a program and then, and as a team. I mean, the guys, you know, the, the pandemic was, was was a little odd because not not a lot of uh, fan involvement, and we get a lot of strength from them. So I think that would just be an added boost for us this year. Uh, I mean, I'm looking at the basketball team. I'm watching all BYU sports and how how the fan base has been so electric in the past, and we're kind of missing that a little bit. And so you'll see the teams rally around each other and then they find some things about them where they're not just depending on the fans anymore to, to create momentum. They're creating it on their own. But imagine when the fans are there to help speed up the process because uh, our, I know, speaking for the, the athletic department, uh, look at our student athletes. They love our fans. They love playing for them. And it's, it's a, it's a, I love the interaction that all our teams have with the fans and it makes a difference. I mean, I, I look at the Gonzaga game that our, our men's team played uh, was it last week or so? And and I think I think the fans would have made been a difference maker in that one, especially at the beginning of the game to start. And so when that when that gets added back in, I think that's probably a little bit more of a boost than than people would imagine, especially here at BYU. And then the the the, the great part about it right now that we're experiencing is that the teams depending on each other. So I think it's going to be an even more enhanced experience for everyone, players and fans included, where we can get the the, the stands full. Yeah, it's going to be really special. Uh, you know, in week two, Utah comes to Provo. Hopefully we have fans, as many as possible, hopefully a full stadium. You know, who knows how this is going to play out the next uh, six months or so, but that would be incredible. And, Kalani, you go from a schedule where, listen, you were just trying to put together a schedule. You played a schedule. It was incredible. 11-1, and you finished in the top 15. It was awesome. Now you go back to, uh, you know, the more traditional schedule this year with – an increased number of Power Fives, seven Power Fives. Is there anything you have to do differently to prepare for a schedule that is notably tougher like that? Well, I think we go into every game expecting to play all 60 minutes uh, with our with our top guys. And then, uh, you know, I think I've been really quick as a head coach to, to pull the starters out of the game, especially this last season, because I thought it was, it was just really valuable to get our um, our younger guys' experience. And so we were able to do that so many times this last year where, we, you know, that, that, that comes maybe a, a couple of times, a few times in the season, normal years. And, and so that, I think that's going to be really valuable for us. But, I mean, imagine the yards that Zach could have thrown if, if, if I would have just kept him in there the whole entire time and if we kept staying aggressive and throwing the ball. So I think uh, we just have to be ready to, to do that, you know, and going into this season and, and not, in you know, we have to expect to do that like we do every year and every game. And if we end up getting a big lead and, and having a dominating performance, and I'm going to pull guys out and put our backups in so they can get that valuable experience to help them help this program move in the, the way that we want it to. We're talking with Kalani Stake, head coach of the BYU football team. Kalani, uh, tis the season to pick at the draft picks. It's just what happens, right? Zach Wilson recently was, uh, I guess, criticized for not being named one of the primary eight captains for on offense, although he was part of the leadership council and given the C on his jersey. We know he's a leader, but what would you say about Zach and that situation? Well, that happened, and I think that when we took all the, the, the votes – um, it ended up coming up when we had the captains. The rest of the team decided that that they needed that we wanted Zach to be a captain. And so he ended up being a captain because the the leaders on the team recognized his leadership value, and and that was important to them. And and you know, not a lot of underclassmen get voted captain. I mean, I was voted captain to, on my senior year. So uh, I, I think it's 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 uh, we have a lot of leaders on this team, and a lot and a, obviously a lot of upperclassmen. And last year's team, and so uh, if you're if you're one of those leaders, it's not. I don't think it's it limits. Uh, we're limited to. If I could have, I would have had twenty captains because that's the type of leadership we had on this team. There's a lot of guys that didn't get that C on their jersey that were great leaders for us, and there's a lot of different ways to lead. But he's definitely a leader of our team. So I I think right now in the NFL, there's a lot of people that are trying to pick apart why you wouldn't, wouldn't like somebody, you know. So. They can go ahead and do whatever they want, but they just have to remember when they when they put that out there in the universe that there's always someone that can prove them wrong, and Zach has a really good track record of proving people wrong. 
Indeed he did throughout his BYU career. We look forward to the NFL draft and, of course, uh, spring ball coming up in a week and a half. And Pro Day uh, later in March, so a lot going on, Kalani. Congratulations on the success of 2020, the new hires, and uh, thanks for the time, as always. Appreciate it. Go Cougs. That's Kalani Stocky on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Deseret First, you know why we show how. So, hey, we know the starting quarterback so now, we right? we know that it's going to be Soljay Mayava. No, I'm just kidding. It's going to be the guy um, who performs the best and... Uh... <laughs> Dot, dot, dot. Coach yeah, speak, coach we, speak, coach speak. We learned a lot um, yeah. there because Jaron is not playing baseball. He's all in on trying to win this job, and that's great. Um, I, it is interesting to see how far they'll let it go. So they won't name one after spring. Remember, when Max Hall was competing with Cade Cooper and Brendan Gassens, they named Max the starter out of spring, and then Cade Cooper transferred. So if BYU did something like that now, I wonder if a dude would transfer, but they'll, they'll keep that going into fall. Um, and we'll discuss coming up, like, when you think we think BYU would name one. But there's a lot going on with BYU football. In a week and a half, they start practice. We're back. Let's Spring go. football. Which is, to me, I joke with this, the second most popular sport of BYU. Oh. So it's not third or fourth? Behind it goes football, spring football, men's basketball, and then, basketball, and then there's a good debate about what's next. And I hope that all of the quarterbacks in the running understand at this point that they all are very capable of playing based on what the injury history has been to the quarterback position over the last decade for BYU. Luckily, it didn't happen last year, and that's, that's Big part why, of why BYU, BYU goes 11-1. Yes. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. It is time for Top 5 Tuesday, and we're doing so in honor of a belated Valentine's Day celebration because it happened on Sunday. We didn't have a live show. So today we feature the Top 5 BYU Sports Power Couples, current, presented by Delta Airlines, Keep Climbing. Number 5, Alyssa Jefferson and Wyatt Lowell. Alyssa Jefferson uh, recently played soccer here, right? Uh, and then Wyatt Lowell's on the basketball team. Unfortunately, tore his uh, Achilles against Gonzaga, but Alyssa was an All-American uh, player. In uh, 2019, yep. Wyatt transferred from Utah Valley. Was looking forward to seeing him play a little more before the injury. Number five. BYU misses Alyssa on defense for sure this year. We talked about that earlier. Number four. And again, at least one of them has to be current. Dalton and Talon Ballard Nixon. We all know what Dalton Nixon meant to BYU basketball in the first year of Mark Pope. Dalton. Dalton. Talon Ballard Nixon is going to be a first-team All-West Coast Conference performer. And with the start that she's off to, Jerem, she might compete for an All-American spot this year. Yeah. She, she is the go-to player for BYU. She's the alpha pin hitter right now. She's yes. playing at a really high level. Okay, number three, Baylor and Elise Romney. They met at a youth conference in El Paso when Baylor was 14 and Elise was 15. Nice. Both went to the same high school in Texas, married in December of 2017. Baylor 2-0 as a starter. He's never, ever lost a start at BYU. What? Uh, 28-25 win over number 14, Boise State, of yep. course. will compete for the starting job this year. Elise Pole Vault broke the uh, indoor record last year at the Boise Invite, and she was an All-American. So she might be a better athlete in her sport than Baylor is in football. Mm-hmm. She's awesome, man. Oh, Baylor, we, Baylor's cool, too. We've heard Baylor say as much <laughs> that Elise is the better athlete in the, in the couple. Number two, Connor and Paisley Harding. Fun story, they first spoke to each other at the tunnel of the BYU basketball practice facility. Got married Uh spring of 2020. They got married in the pandemic, for crying out loud. Love everlasting. Connor averaging 6.3 points, three rebounds, and uh, just about two assists a game. He's starting to find a little bit of a groove now, and Mark Pope has been vocal about that. Paisley's coming off a 28-point game in her last outing. She's uh, trying to get back in the groove. And the number one power couple at BYU right now, Zach and Kennedy Eschenberg. They both play volleyball. Met in 2016. Uh, got married in July 2018. Good dating amount of time. Nicely done. Mm-hmm. Zach was an honorable mention All-American. Came kind of from nowhere um, to do that. And then Kennedy is a first-team All-Conference middle blocker, although she's injured right now. Hoping to get her back soon. Kennedy could be an All-American before she is done at BYU. Yeah. yeah just got to get her out there. She, she is a huge part of that uh, middle portion of BYU's offense. So, uh, volleyball, man. Elite teams, they deserve it. The best of BYU Sports Nation. We'll be right back. 
Rise and shout for the trending topics of the week here on the best of BYU Sports Nation. USF on the schedule for a few more years. No, not San Francisco, as Jerem just talked about. We're talking football now in February. The University of South Florida and BYU in a new agreement. We just gave you the details, which means there are now 11 games on the 2022 BYU football schedule. 12 in 2023. I mean, this is wild that we're this far out, but... We have full schedules, essentially. Jeremy, hey, what, do you, 2030. what do you think about all of this? All right, uh, I, I like what's uh, setting up, and we've talked about this a little bit, that the schedules seem a little, little more manageable going forward. So let's walk through 22 now. Mm-hmm. Season opener at South Florida, Baylor at home, at Oregon, Wyoming, Utah State, bye week at the moment, Arkansas at home, SEC, let's go, okay. winnable SEC, at Liberty, a concept, Bye week at Boise State, Dixie, who's an FCS independent now. Mm-hmm. They're trying to get in, uh, what, the Big Sky probably or something? And then at Stanford. So you look at that, and it, it, is, it is manageable. It is manageable because BYU has uh, power fives. Baylor, Oregon, Arkansas, Stanford. Four. Okay, okay. One more game to add. Maybe BYU makes it a power five. That is manageable. Like, if you're going to try and get ten wins, which to me is like the goal – New Year's Six! BYU couldn't even get to a New Year's Six with no Power Fives. So, just New Year's Six is not happening. I'm sorry. It's not. If BYU can get to 10 wins with four-ish Power Fives, that's a notable season. That's great. So, I think it's pretty manageable. I think there's balance there. You still have rivalries, right? A reminder, where's Utah? Where's Utah? Utah is choosing to play Florida in 22 and 23, and BYU said, fine, we won't play. You know, I think that's a quote from Tom Hummel. Fine! <laughs> um, no, he didn't say that. So, that, one more game to add there. You know, and I would say uh, I, I would prefer a G5 there. It's probably going to be a good. G5. I, I think based on what BYU did in 2020. I hope so. There are some modifications Tom, in how we approach G5, this baby. thing. You got four power fives already. Only one of those feels like a world beater. That's the road game at Oregon. It's always right. tough to play That's in Autzen Stadium early only in the one. season. Yes. Everything else on the schedule seems like it's winnable for BYU. And Baylor at home. That's round two with Jeff Grimes and Eric Mateos. They're coming because to Provo. What are they going to be? Yeah, yeah, in year two of that offense. Yeah. So, and East Carolina is still oh, to be sorry. determined. East Carolina yeah. is on yes. the schedule. They just don't have a specific date for yes. this game yet. And then there'll be one more. Yeah. So, there you go. 11. And, and so, it's not going to be FCS. It's another G5 or a P5 because Dixie's already on there. Yeah. So I, I like 22. The home schedule is nice. It's interesting. Baylor, say what you want about Wyoming. People care about that game because of the longstanding emotions in that rivalry. Okay? People, By people, you mean BYU Laramie? Fans. BYU fans and people in Laramie care about that BYU game. BYU fans care there's, about the Wyoming there's game? There's trash talk there. You think there, BYU fans care BYU about the Wyoming game? BYU wants to destroy Wyoming, do they right, not? Right. They want to destroy But them. if it wasn't on there, no one would think twice. So but I don't the, know that they care that much. They care somewhat. So I'm, I'm, I'm still compelled by that game a little bit based on the animosity involved in that series. Okay? <laughs> This is what I think of BYU and Wyoming. Yeah, very exciting. Yeah, when we're selling that game, we're like, dude, Wyoming, let's go. No. Utah State, Arkansas is a fun game, and then Dixie State. East Carolina is a home game in Provo. So just a matter of uh, is it an open date on October 8th or October 29th, and then whatever else Tom Holmo decides to add. Yeah. I I would like uh, October 29th to be open. That is uh, near my birthday. So I would like that free. (laughs) Tom. Okay. 2023, Jerem. Yeah. There are 12 games. 12 games 12 now. games on the schedule in 2023. Talk through it. Listen to this slate. Tennessee in Pro Bowl. That's a great season opener. To open. That's awesome. At Virginia on September 9th. At Utah State. I know it's back-to-back road games. In fact, there are three road games in a row, but one's in Utah Logan. Utah State a road game? At Arkansas. Then BYU has Rice. Make a trip to Love Fresno. Rice. Three home games, Boise State, USF, just added today, and UNLV. Then BYU goes on the road at UCF, Okay. Southern Utah home for senior day, and then BYU finishes the season at USC. So Thanksgiving week. Four power fives Mm -hmm. on that schedule, which appears to be done, but it's 2021. That's what year it is, right? Man, it was a long year last year. Um, We'll see if that's the schedule, right? Things can change. But – that, again, 
that BYU is in a position where if BYU did win ten games with four Power Fives and some quality G fives on there, like you think about UCF and Boise State are on there. Those are two of the top uh, Group of Five programs. And like, Fresno I'm not saying like last not- year. I'm talking like the last yeah. like five to years, right? Last beyond the last five years, Central USCF's not actually been good. Um, that good, right? So yes, I. I love these schedules. I think there's some balance. Do you want some big names? You got it in Tennessee and USC. Like, I wish Utah was on these schedules. That would be kind of the cherry on the top. Um, but because they're not, you know, you, you add another game. But Virgi- there's some intrigue. Virginia and Bronco and the whole deal, assuming he's still there. Utah State is always uh, compelling. Arkansas is an SEC team. Like, on the road there. BYU making their first trip to Arkansas. I'm fine with this. Yeah, I like these schedules. You know, And, and if you prefer something beefier, then you love a seven-win season. That's what I would say to you. Um, so I'm, I'm cool with these schedules. Because I like winning more than anything else. I like winning more than a schedule. I feel like BYU fans love a, the idea of a schedule and a game announcement than the actual game sometimes. Just be careful with that. I love the series with USF. I like that BYU is playing in another NFL stadium when they go to Tampa. Raymond James, the host of the Super Bowl this year. That's a cool yeah. stadium to play in. I'm fine with you, USF, by the way. I, I think it's, it's whatever. They had a couple years where they won like nine and ten games. But like since 2011, they've had like four winning seasons. They're, just, they're not a great program, but there is a storyline there with how the 2019 game played out. There is. Because Jaron Hall who starts that game and plays a pretty good game, right? Gets a a concussion. Baylor Romney comes in, leads BYU down the field a couple times, but doesn't punch it in to get a win. There's there's some heck to pay, right, for BYU in that stadium. Oh, by the way, that's where they played the Super Bowl. Kind of fun. Will Tom Brady still be with the Buccaneers next year? 47-year-old Tom Brady. (laughs) (laughs) Like, yeah, it's interesting. And, And the fact that BYU is going... And a reminder, BYU plays South Florida this year as well. So all of a sudden... It's, it's uh, BYU playing in 2019 and 21 and 22 and 23 with UCF, which brings us to our stat of the day. Mm. It's the BYU Sports Nation stat of the day. BYU is going to play South Florida from 2019 to 23 more than it plays Utah. Four times to two times. Yeah, that's weird. Because Utah is playing Florida in 22 and 23. So that well, is BYU, and BYU opted is playing the schedule of Florida team too in the absence of the Utes. <laughs> Utah got Florida. <laughs> And we got South Florida and Central Florida. But it's all good. Uh, go and win those games. Go and win those games. At UCF, you know, beating UCF in the bowl game was a nice win. I know UCF finished 6-4, and four, but always good to beat those guys. So Josh Heupel gets the job at Tennessee, mm-hmm. and now BYU is going to play Tennessee with Josh Heupel. Good. Can't wait for BYU to destroy another Josh Heupel team. <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> I like the, the balance of four power fives. Yeah. Uh, four to five, group of fives, a few of those are high level, and then there are some teams on there yeah. that BYU should absolutely just manhandle. I'm glad that my requests have been... Uh, just destroy. Heard. Okay. <laughs> yes, these schedules <laughs> that have been put into place just this year, right? It all can't... <laughs> just this year? It's been a long time. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm three or four years on this wagon. Let's go. <laughs> Hop on board. Plenty of room. It's the COVID shuffle. The West Coast Conference collaboratively with all of their partners get together and create what they think is the ideal final week of the season. What partners? Like TV partners? Is that what you're, what are you saying? Yes. Because it wasn't in the league with the team. <laughs> Clearly not. Again, we'll hear from Mark Pope in just a moment, but BYU now has San Francisco on the home schedule and St. Mary's. We think the third and fourth, if not the fourth and fifth best teams in the conference, along with Pepperdine, obviously Gonzaga at the top. But the point is, Gone who? rather than BYU hosting Santa Clara and kind of and nobody coasting to the end, not having any opportunity to slip up. Now, now there are some real competitors in front of the Cougars, and this was not expected. Let's hear from head coach Mark Pope and his thoughts on the now unexpected schedule changes. I have a whole host of um, very clearly delineated comments in my mind that I'm not going to share about that. Our focus right now is is um, we have a huge game Saturday, and um, and and our guys are really special at being focused, and that is the whole key. You know, as you get into these kind of dog days of 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 February right now, the whole key is can your team, and it's not easy, 
can they stay focused on the task at hand and not get distracted by any of the other nonsense, no matter where it's coming from. Um, and, and our guys did a great job of that tonight. We need to do a, a good job of that on Saturday. And, and uh, we'll just keep taking care of our business, let all the craziness happen around us. BYU at LMU on Saturday. Quad 2 road opportunity like last night at Pacific was. And then back home for a Quadrant 3 game against San Francisco and maybe a Quad 2 against St. Mary's, depending on where the Gales are by the time BYU and St. Mary's actually get to that game. More games, seemingly tougher. Jerem, do you like the rescheduling effort by the West Coast Conference here? First off, this was expected. I've been hinting at this since Wednesday, uh, but here we are. San Francisco, St. Mary's, I don't know that it adds much. So from the league's perspective, you want BYU in, obviously. This only creates a situation. that This isn't going to help BYU a ton. A quad three at home doesn't help BYU a ton. Hopefully, St. Mary's stays a quad two. They're at 72 right now. If they fall to 76, that's a quad three. So uh, if BYU beats St. Mary's, does St. Mary's become a quad three home game? You hope St. Mary's has a nice finish to the season and they can kind of rebound. But, man, it's not, it's not a typical St. Mary's year. So, um, yeah, Mark Pope obviously bothered. Obviously bothered. Um, there's risk in knocking out BYU, and we can quantify that amount of money. It's 1.7 mil over six years for the league. Some more to BYU and then the rest of the league. So I think it's a little weird. I, I see what they're trying to do. Like, I get it, but I don't necessarily agree with it. Because Gonzaga's clearly in, of course, duh. But BYU is, is in, but if they lose a game or two and kind of stumble to the finish, there's a chance that if BYU, if BYU loses two games, I think there's a real chance that they're... On the bubble and a little nervous. I think one loss, BYU's, not, BYU's now in the last eight in. But with two losses, it's like maybe BYU would be out. It depends on who you, if BYU loses uh, to those teams. But I also see the argument, hey, if you're a tourney team in like a seven or eight seed, why don't you just play these games and win at home? Like what's, what's the issue? But from the league standpoint, they need to work in the benefit of the membership. And this doesn't benefit BYU a ton to like, Oh, maybe BYU climbs up a seed line or two. Probably not with these two particular games. If St. Mary's was better, then yes. But St. Mary's is not great this year. To be clear, I am more worried for BYU about their game at LMU tomorrow than I am about the prospect of St. Mary's or San Francisco in Provo. That says a lot about uh, St. Mary's and San Francisco. I know. It does. Which BYU already won on the road, but they were tough games. Tough games, but I like BYU's chances and focus, and I feel like those teams are sputtering towards the end of the regular season. I'm not threatened by them because they Are you threatened by LMU? I am a little bit. Interesting. I am a little bit. Just based on the location and the high that BYU's coming off of against Pacific, can they maintain something like that in a place that they've had some weird games? LMU kind of feels like Pepperdine to me a little bit. I know it's not as weird as Firestone Fieldhouse, but there is... That idea that, oh man, sometimes BYU hasn't played very well at LMU. They haven't shot well in that gym. So there's more concern for me about the quad two road game than the home prospect of San Francisco and St. Mary's. And you're right. You did hint at it. I thought that the league would add a Saturday game. I didn't know that Santa Clara was going to be shoved off the schedule, though. So, so that's BYU why, doesn't even play Santa yeah, Clara this not, year. Yeah, not one time. So yeah. that, to me, was unexpected. Like, whoa, okay, so Santa Clara is just not happening at all, and you're going to throw in San Francisco and St. Mary's? I thought one of the two would show up on Saturday, and they'd leave Santa Clara. So that was kind of the biggest shocker to me. Mark Pope is doing his best to just maintain consistency, focus, one game at a time. And I I understand his frustration because it's, well, this is what we have left on the schedule. Let's just prepare for that. Let's just prepare. And now all of a sudden it's shuffled again, and it's, you have to adjust again. And they didn't have to. The league didn't have to do this to BYU or to any other team. It's not the shuffle that bothers me. It's who was shuffled yeah. into this. It's like, wait, those are tougher games. Yes. What, are, what are you doing? Like, don't you want BYU in the tourney? Like, if you didn't want BYU in the tourney, but you're not going to reschedule Gonzaga, this is what you would do. This is what you would do. Because BYU had these two sitting there unscheduled for a... Uh, second time. They weren't going to add Pepperdine a third time or Gonzaga a third time. So it's it's just weird. And maybe the league's going, listen, we think this will help you if you win. But it's like, but it doesn't really help BYU that much. Yeah, there are two more top 100 games on the schedule because they're both in Provo. 
It's not like these They'd have to be massive the, opportunities. Yes, yes. It, it's, it mattereth not. It's just a little weird. It does stink us. How do I to feel me. about it? It's just weird. But. Well, par for the course, right? Here we it's, are, yes. Yeah, 2021 weird. Who's number one? Eric Galco, the president of Optimum Scouting and NFL Draft Insider, has added his opinion and vote to one Zach Wilson going number one in the NFL Draft. His opinion joins former ESPN NFL insider Mark Schlereth recently and longtime football analyst Joe Theismann. Even Urban Meyer, the now head coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars, before he was in that position, said Zach Wilson may just deserve the number one spot. Jerem, is it time to start seriously talking about Zach Wilson being drafted number one overall? Let me coach you through how this works, everybody. The pendulum swings... Um... If before the draft, so whoa, what are the great things? Maybe you should go number one, and and it it actually started on the negative, which was oh, maybe Zach's not one of the best quarterbacks in the draft because he wasn't even a captain at BYU. There there would just be this evaluation period, right? You can go to the Iring Science Center. Do they still have the pendulum there? Is it still there? Yeah. Okay, so you can watch that and just think Zach Wilson number one, Zach Wilson fifth best quarterback in the draft. Like it, the pendulum will swing. I don't seriously think that Zach will be the number one pick, but it's fine if it's conversation. That's fun. Like, does he do? I said yesterday, he does some things better than Trevor Lawrence. He does. Some of those things are ball placement. I think footwork in the pocket. I think he's a good runner. I think Trevor Lawrence is a very good runner as well. Yep. Trevor has a six foot six frame, won a natty, went to a couple national championship games as well. He's played at a higher level. Now, was Zach Wilson afforded the same opportunity at BYU playing with the same kind of players, the same level, and the same kind of games? No. So Zach is intriguing that way. We kind of know what Trevor is, and he's really stinking good. Zach is interesting because he had a great year, didn't play a Power 5 schedule, but the way he played in those games was intriguing. So it makes sense that Zach would be discussed in this ilk. I don't think he will be, but he could be as high as number two. I know that a lot of people are really caught up in the look at who Trevor Lawrence played against and look at who Zach Wilson played against. But then there is also the argument, well, look who Trevor Lawrence is throwing to and handing the ball off to, and look who Zach Wilson is throwing to and handing the ball off to. Somewhat relative, right? Okay. So I'm not really so much into that argument. I'm just looking at the majority voice in all of this conversation. And I still feel like Mel Kuyper and Todd McShay and all of the guys at the NFL Network are all in on Trevor Lawrence as number one and Zach Wilson as either the second or third best quarterback. So while it's nice to hear this and the numbers are growing, like, whoa, okay, so Zach's getting some more attention. It just makes me feel stronger that Zach is going to be for sure a top four pick at worst. If he doesn't go to the Jaguars, which – Right now, it's still a hot take that he's going to go number one over Trevor Lawrence. Then he's going to go at number two to the Jets or whoever trades up to that pick. Or maybe three if someone trades up to that pick. Or fourth to the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, The pendulum for me right now, mentally, based on the regression to the mean rhetoric of all of the most prominent NFL voices, is that Zach is going to be for sure a top four pick and one of the the first three quarterbacks taken. And we're assuming the Jets and Falcons do and take do indeed take quarterback. Like they may not. Right. right. Um, but if they do, yeah, we think that, you know, it's it's Wilson or Fields. We still have pro days to get through. We still have interviews. We still have the combine. Whatever the combine um, is going to be yeah, for those and, individuals. And, a, and apparently they will go to Indianapolis. I don't think it's the physical part, but it's uh, in terms of performance, but it's everything else. And, uh, yeah, and, and in March, BYU is going to have a pro day, and it's, it's uh, going to be a fun exhibition of skill for a lot of guys. So, yeah, I, will he go number one? Probably not. No. Um, because Trevor is a proven commodity at the highest level of the game. There's it's, too much pressure. Well, like, there's no way Trevor doesn't go one. I just don't see it. There's too much pressure on the Jacksonville Jaguars general manager and head coach Urban Meyer to take Trevor Lawrence. If they don't take Trevor Lawrence... And I think it'd be weird if they they don't. take Zach Wilson and it doesn't go as planned. That whole franchise is going to implode. Like even if Zach ends up being a better quarterback than Trevor at the next level, Trevor's still the right pick at one. Yes, still the right because pick of one. all of those factors. All the fans obvious, and all yes. the obvious choices. Yeah, this is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio.
hear what the coaches, athletes, and experts have to say. Here's another great interview from the week on the best of BYU Sports Nation. Another guy who can handle basically any situation you can dream up of uh, is BYU baseball coach Mike Littlewood on What's the up? Desert First Credit Union Hotline. Coach, it's so fantastic to be talking baseball. How are you feeling right now? I'm feeling so good, except when I look outside, then I, when I look on the news and see Austin has uh, the same amount of snow as we do. So, And that's where we're headed. But um, I'm feeling good about things, yeah. Yeah, BYU baseball is working through the snow, and like you said, we didn't know that it was going to be following you to Texas, but just out of curiosity, how's the heated field looking at Miller Park right now? Uh, you cannot see any turf at all. It's all snow, but but uh, we'll, we should be able to see a little turf at, at about 5 p.m., although we're so lucky here to have the indoor practice facility that um, we can do full scrimmages in there, and that's where we'll be today, and it's just it's awesome to have that. Okay, you're headed to Texas, like you mentioned, to play Texas State. We're going to call this the Eric Mateos Bowl since he was at Texas State and then BYU and now he's at Baylor. But uh, then you're playing uh, UT, a big one. Uh, you know. So there is a bit of news, though, regarding Friday's game. Do you mind telling us the latest on the shifting of the schedule? Yeah, I actually just got off the phone with uh, Coach Trout at Texas State. They, they shut down school through Friday just because of the weather and the power outages and different things. A lot of their players don't even have power in their apartments and so they're kind of dealing with that they had he sent me a picture they had like four to six inches of snow on their field which is wow it's like it's a one in a hundred year storm i mean it's just crazy and so um it, it was supposed to be really cold on friday and i think it's a good decision so we're going to just basically bump our friday game to tuesday so we'll still play four games but we won't play friday we'll play a doubleheader saturday starting at noon texas time and then it gets pretty tough we'll play uh monday tuesday at texas state and then we, we were supposed to have Tuesday off, and then we'll go Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday at Texas. So it's uh, going to be a full week of baseball. We're warming up our arms just in case. Yeah, do you have <laughs> enough pitchers for that? <laughs> How's, yeah, how we'll is... get two more flights if you guys can throw. <laughs> I, I promise you. How is the pitching staff looking? Because we know that at this level of baseball, when you get into the college ranks and certainly minor and major re, uh, league ranks, that it, a lot of it is pitching. So what's the pitching staff look like right now? It looks really good. The, the only uh, We have a little ding with Tyson Heaton, who's one of our top six pitchers. Started a couple games as a freshman last year. Um, he's out for another week or two. Just kind of – he, he uh, came back from COVID, did some things too quickly, and so he's got a little bit of an issue. But he'll be back with us in a couple weeks. Other than that, we look great. Um, this is the most depth we've, we've ever had since I've been here. Um, we have a lot of guys who have great velocity, can have good command, can really, really pitch. And I feel like we have – probably a dozen options to go to in games that um, that I really feel comfortable in getting guys out. Sometimes you're like, you send a guy out there and you're like, oh, please hit it to us. It's going to get hit, but please hit it to us. That's our <laughs> only chance. But but these guys are different, and we got different guys, uh, a couple left-handers in the low 90s, uh, Mabius and Co- uh, Cooper McKeon and Boston Mabius. And, and we, we, we just have uh, – I like our well-rounded staff. So we just need some experience, some Division One baseball experience. Who are some of the newcomers that stick out that will have an impact this season? Well, I think Boston Mabius is on the on the pitching side is going to be one of them. He's a left-hander, return missionary, 90-92, really good uh, 12-6 curveball, developing a good change. He'll spray it around just a little bit here and there, but but um, he may start one one of the games at Texas State or Texas. We, we haven't decided that yet. He'll be a key for us. Uh, on the offensive side, Cole Gamble. Uh, transfer from went to Lone Peak High School. Transfer from Salt Lake Community College. We'll start in right field for us. Six uh, four, good uh, left-handed hitter, uh, really good defensive outfielder, and and so we're looking for uh, big things from him. But you look all around our our field. Even Hayden Latham last year, who was two-time conference player of the year in JUCO and like preseason um, All-American JUCO, he came and struggled a little bit last year. We just but he's looking really good this year. It's just experience. The one nice thing I'll say is our hitters over the fall and early early winter right now, since January when we got back, they're facing incredible pitching every single day. So there's really nothing that's going to surprise them when um, when they step on the field and face Texas or Texas State, who are really two incredible teams. So And then Oregon State and then Utah. So it doesn't get easier after this. BYU baseball head coach Mike Littlewood with us on BYU Sports Nation. Coach, how would you sum up the emotions and the atmosphere of the locker room right now 
because it's been... My lights just went off. Okay, hey, motion detector. <laughs> Let's get some you, light back on that beautiful face. really still. Wow. <laughs> How would yeah. you sum up it the... It does that every once in a while. Yeah. The the emotions and atmosphere of, of a locker room that hasn't played against another opponent really in what feels like almost a year. Yeah, I mean, they're ready to go. They really are. It, it seems... Uh, who was it? Danny Jelich came to me yesterday. We were, we were in the IPF hitting. He goes... Man, it seems like it seems like two years since we played, and I had a couple of players say that to me yesterday, and just that. And we've heard we've heard a couple. Interestingly enough, we've heard from a couple other coaches that have have talked to our staff and said that their first couple of games out, they they didn't see the energy that they really wanted out of their teams, and so we had a little bit of a talk with our guys, like, hey, this is hopefully at this point in life after this last year, you you don't take one day for granted. I mean, you're going out every day is a blessing that you get to play put a uniform on and play this game. And so um, I think the excitement's there. Um, I think we're ready to go overall. You were picked fourth in the preseason poll, but no individuals were put on the preseason team. Was that seen as a slight at all? Well, if you look at our stats last year, I wouldn't have put anybody on either. Um, we, <laughs> we hit 200 as a team, and I was surprised we were voted fourth, to be honest with you. And, and I, I never uh, – you guys know this. I don't really – I don't even look at those. I don't really care about them. In fact, the, the worst year we ever had, we were voted first, if you guys remember that. Mm-hmm. And, yep. uh, so it's it's all about how you end. And I'm, with our tough schedule that we've got, um, after this Texas trip, we go to Oregon State. And then we what, what's going to be kind of fun, and hopefully we'll, we'll allow some fans in, we play Utah on a weekend series, which we haven't done since because we're not in the same league. So we're always playing Utah on a midweek. So we're throwing our bullpen against their bullpen. And now we get to face face them head to head in a in a three game series, our best pitcher against their best starters. Um, so it's going to be kind of fun that way. What's the coolest bat, or who ha- gave you the coolest bat behind you? Well, there's one from Dominican um, that they use. That's uh, kind of a, a bat that they use. It's like they use this with um with these little. Uh, kind of like bottle caps that they throw. They'll move a lot. Uh, wow. So this is kind of a cool one. Yeah, and then the one I remember the most. This is an interactive is interview. It's, it's a skinny fungo that, that I got when I was at Alta High School, and we got invited to uh, – Alta wasn't very good a couple years before I got there, and we got invited to this tournament in Anaheim. I think it was called, um, gosh, the Top Cards or something like that. Anyway, it was uh, – and we got this fungo. And I when I first got this fungo, I thought, I'm going to keep every every new fungo I get. And just keep a collection. And so over 30 years, that's what you see behind me. So Awesome. Fantastic stuff. Mike Littlewood with us on BYU Sports Nation. Heaven forbid you have to deal with the COVID postponement or even cancellation in the approaching season. But what are the protocols in place if somebody does test positive so that you can hopefully keep playing and keep that player or players in isolation? Yeah, so baseball is is kind of a, a mid-contact sport. So we have different protocols call than than basketball or golf we all have different ones and so um we we tested friday we tested monday we'll get our results today if anybody's positive then we contact trace and then they go into quarantine for the specified amount of time i think it's 10 days from first symptoms and um bump somebody else on the travel squad and if anybody we really try to hound the guys you know it's just a way of life now that that you wear these that's just part of part of the deal and so we really try to hound them at, at practice when you're anywhere except on the field. You're, you've got your mask on. That way, if somebody tests as positive and you contact Trace, then you can say, yeah, I had my mask up. I, I wasn't around them for 15 minutes. And I'll you know, answer all the questions honestly. And then you get to go. If, if you don't, um, then you get to quarantine as well. And so I think they understand the importance of all that. But I just told the guys, and I think they've got a, a good perspective of you wake up today, tackle today. And then let's see what tomorrow brings when we wake up tomorrow. And, and uh, there's going to be some disappointments. I know there's going to be some series canceled, I would think. Uh, we'll try to find somebody else to play. And if we can't, we'll, we'll play each other and, and move on and try to develop these guys the best we possibly can this spring. Coach, great to catch up with you. Let's give you some BYU Sports Nation karma to take with you to Texas. Hopefully it warms up the weather down there and brings back uh, a lot of W's for BYU baseball. All right, thanks. Love you guys. All right, Coach Littlewood with us on love BYU Sports Station. We love him, too. Absolutely. The love is shared. We're, hey, all, we're sharing the love. I really do love Mike Littlewood. He's, he's the best. He's so good looking, right? He's the best. Oh, trust me. Talk to my wife. Yeah, Brittany my, my wife, too. Big fan. Okay. Yeah, big, big fan of the baseball team. <laughs>
I'm like, why, why are you always watching the BYU baseball game? Why is your crush on the baseball coach so public? Wow, that's so <laughs> weird. And we just brought it up. We'll be right back with more of the best of BYU Sports Nation. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. Prop picks for BYU men's basketball at Pacific tonight, presented by Bodyguards. Protection for a life worth living. Learn more at bodyguards.com. I'll start with number one, Jerem. More rebounds tonight. Yep. Lauren Gustin for BYU women's basketball, one of the best rebounders in the entire country, or Caleb Lohner and Gideon George combined for BYU men's basketball. It's 12.9 versus 9.9. I'm going with 9.9. Ooh. I think it'll be a big rebounding night for George and Lohner. Because Pacific's going to miss a lot of three-pointers? Because rebounding. Well, I also think it's a tough matchup with Jill Townsend and the Worth sisters with Gonzaga and Lauren Gustin. I trust in Lauren Gustin's tenacity, grit, ability to get the basketball. Riley Nelson? So I'm going to go with Lauren Gustin here to hit her season average and just eke out a win there. Okay, number two, who will be BYU's second leading rebounder? I'm going to go with Richard Harward. Heard of him. He is the second leading rebounder on the team right now. It just depends on how much he plays and if it's a good matchup. So I'm hoping Richard Harward sees the floor a lot tonight. I'm going with the third leading rebounder on the team, which is Alex Garcella. Mm. He's going to get some strays. He's just going to wander. <laughs> wander rebounds? A couple, couple straight cats coming his way. <laughs> Number three. This one's so random and I love it. Who will score the final points or point for BYU? Brother Trevin Nell. So I feel like this game's going to be close and BYU's going to need to make free throws and the ball's going to be in the hands of the point guard. I'm going Alex Barcelo here to make some free throws late in the game and score the final points. Those are your prop picks presented by Bodyguards. Our LMU prop picks and the Pacific Review presented by Tim Daly Ford, part of the Tim Daly Auto Group serving Utah since 1968. We haven't said it. The proper name on first reference is the University of the Pacific. The University of the Pacific. I feel like we should have done that at some point. Here we are. I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. All right. Extend our due diligence to get things 100% correct, which we were not last night. a long name. In any regard with our prop picks against the University of the Pacific. Just on first reference. Number one, question, more rebounds last night. Lauren Gustin alone or Caleb Lohner and Gideon George combined? The answer is your mom. Direct push. Lauren had 10. Gideon and Caleb oh, combined geez. for 10. <laughs> so, you know, it's a good prop pick. Seriously, that was great. Number two, who will be BYU's second leading rebounder? Uh, Spender, you said Richard Harwood. He had one rebound. Mm-hmm. I said Alex Barcello. He had three rebounds. It was Matty Himes with seven. seven. Yeah. Okay, so we're combined 0 for 2 there. Okay. All right, last one. Who will score the final points for BYU against the University of the Pacific. So proppy. Colby Lee, jumper with a minute left. You said Trevin Nell. It almost was Trevin oh, Nell. I, I thought it was going to be Alex Barcelo because I thought the game would be a little bit closer and BYU would need to make free throws. Oh. Uh, not the case. Yeah, that was bad. 28-point win. Over. So 0-0. Zero, zero. Uh, we now turn to LMU to determine who's going to spin the wheel of consequence next week. And we bring in Ben Bagley to present the next set of prop picks. Let's start here. Which Cougar will hit the most three-point shots against LMU? Oh, Jeremy, I'm going with Caleb Lohner. I'm riding the Caleb Lohner wave until it's not a thing anymore. I think he is shooting with confidence. He's playing a ton. I think he can knock down two or three tomorrow against LMU and lead BYU. Brandon Averett will return to Okay. Number two. Who will score the third basket, field goal or free throw, (laughs) for BYU? Jeremy, you go first. Matt Hobbs. (laughs) Matt Hobbs on a pick and roll. I love how random these are. That is very random. so random. I'm here for this. I Uh, love it. Alex Barcelo for me. Okay, why not? Yeah, Alex Barcelo. Yeah. Oh, number three. Last one. Caleb Lohner will score how many points tomorrow? I'm going to go with 14 points for Caleb oh, Loner tomorrow. Well, if he's going to lead in threes. Yeah. Against LMU. Yeah, I got to go high. 11. 11. Mm-hmm. I like that number because it's my favorite number, so I'm kind of jealous oh. that you picked that. Okay, Stranger Things. What's up? But I'm I'm going with 14 points. Makes three threes, free throws, alley-oop dunk. 
Come on, Caleb. And let's he has go. A safety. He's got the karma too, so maybe that'll help us out. That's still a thing. Sweet. <laughs> Seven and a half years into this thing. I forgot about it's it. Still a thing. Join the conversation 24 7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook using the hashtag BYUSN. The best of BYU Sports Nation rolls on after this. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Speaking of 5,000, Jerem, mm-hmm. the guy with the fastest 5,000 meter time in the world this year, number one in the NCAA, what? clearly, and running for the number one ranked cross country team, number six men's track and field team, is Connor Mance, who joins us now on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Connor, welcome, my friend. Congratulations on an incredible race and weekend. Oh, thank you for having me, and thank you for that. (laughs) (laughs) It's a lengthy intro, I know, but you did it. You brought this on yourself. How does it feel to be the fastest man in the world right now in the 5,000 meters? You know, it's kind of weird because I feel like that isn't something that, like, initially hits me. It's just kind of like, okay, like, I ran a really good time, and that's kind of, you know, the the first thing that comes to mind. That that title, I don't know, it's just kind of – Kind of different. <laughs> yeah, so when when you finish the race, do you realize what you've done? Um, it was more of just like, uh, I, it was, when I finished the race, I was just too tired. I just, <laughs> I, I just, I, I had Casey, Claire, and Brandon Garnica like, tell me good job, and then I, then I laid down for a bit on the track because I was just trying to just, you know, reco- re- recuperate. Not sure if that's even happened yet, but trying to recover mentally from the hard race. So at what point do you realize you set some notable records uh, and times uh, this year, not only in the NCAA, but in the, in the world? Um, I didn't, re- I knew I would set the school record because that was kind of the goal heading into the race. Um, but I didn't know it was a world leading time or, well, I knew it would be an NCAA leading time. I knew that, um, in the race with Brandon Garnica and Casey Klinger as my teammates, whoever ended up winning that race was going to get the NCAA lead just because we're so competitive with one another and in a good way. Um, but I didn't know until I think the next day that it was a world leading time. So I want to know about the mental preparation and, and even into the early part of the race, when did you know I'm feeling really good and I think this could be a super fast time? At, at what point in the race did you realize okay this this could be really good? Um well so in a long long way of explaining the race maybe um early on we 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 knew that um all of the guys that we were running with on our team were really fit so we were we had a pacer who was going to come out and pace us and um I was feeling great when the pacer was there. But uh, he took us through a couple laps, um, a few seconds slow. So at that point, I mean, before I knew that it was so slow, I knew it was going to be a, I thought it was going to be a great night. And then when I found out it was slow, I was like, oh, no wonder I'm feeling so, so smooth right now. <laughs> um, but it, probably with about a thousand meters left in the race, so about four fifths in, did I know like we were going to run really fast. Can you run past the pacer? Is that, is that kosher? Uh, well, it's, it's, I don't know if kosher is the right way to say it. Probably not kosher, but, um, coach Eistone yelled at us about, uh, three laps into the race and he's like, you guys are slow. You go past the pacer. So yeah. we did. Yeah. Uh, Listen, pacer, you got to go faster, bro. <laughs> this is Larry Bird running around. No, I need, I need some speed here. Okay. So yeah. I want to go back to when you found out you had run the fastest time in the world this year what what was your reaction to that um it, it was it was i was just like well wow, that's really cool but then i don't know it's sometimes hard to really hype yourself up because it's i mean it's only it's only february right now so who cares connor that's it, awesome man i know <laughs> <laughs> um, i was pretty hyped understandably so connor mance with this on byu sports nation how long does it take you to recover from a race like that um, it depends on how well, uh, how well we get to recover and how much is going on. Um, 
Coach I Stone had to still do our long run the next day, so it probably took me till about yesterday till I was feeling about a hundred percent again. Um, but yeah, usually, yeah, it just depends on how well we, uh, how hard we push it in the next few days. But for me, it took till about yesterday morning. Okay, obviously a while, and you're at top level, so I can't imagine what somebody else is going to do <laughs> and how long it would take them to recover from this race. But is there like a special meal post-race that helps you feel better about things or, or expedites the recovery process? Um, I don't know if there's a, a post-meal. Usually in, in the longer races, you finish so late that you just try to look for anything that's open, which – um during outdoor cross-country season is always in and out because we race at like midnight so what's what's open at 1 (laughs) a.m um but no like usually just kind of you know you'll get the trainers to work on your legs just kind of get a massage out and i don't know maybe go for some pizza or something and (laughs) that's it (laughs) The meals of champions, I, In-N-Out burgers and pizzas. I love Who that. knew? I do the yeah. same thing minus the running. Um, Connor, <laughs> yeah. Hey, Connor, you're halfway there. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'm about 5,000 meters away, but yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> what's, the, uh, what's the story behind running in the snow? That was the, ra- that was the long run the next day, I take it, around a, a lake in, yeah. in a Seattle news station. Got some footage of you guys? Yeah, so we were out running um, – so the day, so during the race, it was snowing pretty hard. And then the next day we like, we all like looked outside and it was just like, I don't know, probably seven or eight inches of new snow. And it was just like, all right, like this next run is going to be a lot slower than we'll usually do it, but it'll be a lot more, um, I, I want to say fun. I don't think it was for most of the guys. I think <laughs> everybody was <laughs> sick of that cold, but, um, a little more interesting. I'll, I'll say it like that. I love. Uh, we're looking some of the vi- at some of the video now. There are people literally like uh, snowshoeing outside or just walking, and then you guys come running by. Like, ain't no thing. We got to get our run in here. Yeah, yeah. It's it is funny. We passed a lot of people like skiing, like on uh, cross country skis and snowshoeing, and like we saw some people. I mean, I, this surprised me probably the most. I saw a lot of people carrying like snowboards and whatnot to go to this little like little hill in the park that we were running around and just you know go up walk up just snowboard down and it was probably the tiniest tail i've ever seen anybody snowboard down but hey you know <laughs> it's seattle ain't, ain't, yeah, it's, it's ain't no seattle. rock canyon you know no nah. <laughs> connor mance with us on byu sports nation we're looking at the rankings connor for the cross country teams and the track and field teams number one men's cross country number two women's cross country number six men's track and field indoor number eight women's track and field indoor how has this come to pass given the COVID-19 pandemic because it's shut a lot of people down. So how have your teams navigated through this to an elite level? So I think a lot of us, um, like our theme at the beginning of this school year was rise up. And I think a lot of that helped out because it was like, we don't want to just be back to where we were. We took this as an opportunity to work harder, put more time in, um, not not take any time off it, it's luckily our sports are um for the most part you're able to do them on your own or at least with like a small group of people you don't need all the facilities and everything like to go for a run all i need is like pair of, sh- pair of shoes you know and whatever I, I can wear whatever i mean some things are more comfortable than others but like you can just go out for a run and i think our team saw that as an opportunity that like instead of focusing on oh what we can't do at this time like all right what can we do trails are still open to run on um there's tons of opportunities to still meet up and um for a while we weren't able to meet up during the pandemic and so it was just you know going on your own going on runs and i think our other event groups kind of saw them as the same thing like let's just get fit and i think it just carried over and i think some teams just caught off caught um just kind of surprised and caught them off guard off guard connor congratulations again it's good to see you rocking the ed eye stone throwback mustache as well Uh, um jared ward as well (laughs) let's give you some BYU sports nation karma for your future races keep up the good work my friend all right thank you
Connor Mance on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Deseret First, you know why we show how. Pretty, pretty crazy, man. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Let's whip it. The Cougar Whip Around, presented by Visible Supply Chain Management, tackling America's most challenging shipping problems. With the adjusted BYU men's hoop schedule, do you expect the Cougars to win out? Yes, I still expect BYU to win the remaining games at home. They will be favored in all. It's just about getting through LMU on the road, and then I'm really not worried about BYU taking care of business in Provo, even if it is San Francisco and St. Mary's. He's got to blow out LMU. Another blowout. Yeah. I hope. Yeah. I, I would like, love like to see 14 it. plus. It's happening. Not 17 plus, but 14 plus. I'm glad that you adjusted that. Um, yeah, yeah. BYU's going to win the next three. It's 83% and 76% from uh, Ken Palm. I feel pretty confident. Jeremy, B- next week. BYU women's basketball unseats Gonzaga from their 17 game win streak last night, 61 56 at the Marriott Center. Great game. Incredible finish. Shaylee Gonzalez, Paisley Harding, clutch set, moments. Set three. I'm like kind of distracted calling the men's volleyball game. I'm watching the last, like, 20 seconds, honestly. Like, Steve Vale kind of stepped in and doing play-by-play. I was just like, oh, I want to watch this. <laughs> this is our life, right? <laughs> you got to keep track of everything. Even the game, the I'm like, men's hoops? Moment. Yeah. Did BYU women's basketball just lock up an NCAA tournament spot? Probably. This team's really good. I think they'll be in. Portland, who's a little down, they won the tourney last year. Um, and then next next week, Santa Clara and San Francisco on the road. So probably, but if BYU loses one, they may be kind of out. It depends. We only have one bracketologist in women's, and he says BYU was the last team in before that win. So BYU would be firmly in right now, but you never know. It feels like BYU will have jumped at least five or six spots in that last eight-in category with the win against Gonzaga. As long as BYU takes care of Portland tomorrow and they avoid the so cliche let down after the big win, then they'll yeah. be okay. This, I think they'll win out the regular season and be okay going. That'd be good. Yeah. If they do, I think they're in. I, I feel like they're in. Yeah. Men's volleyball is 4-1, but dropped the match. Uh, losing sets at home, still winning. Do, do you expect a more dominant performance? You were right, by the way. You said yesterday, like, I think it's going to be close. Grand Canyon's probably as good as Pepperdine, and it, it turned out to be that way. Um, I, I just, based on what I've the conversations I've had with some BYU men's volleyball players and the trash that Grand Canyon talks, I I was a little bothered that it wasn't more dominating. Well, I, it didn't. That trash talk didn't happen last night. It didn't happen last night. It didn't happen. But the emotions of it from previous matches. Maybe the still guys carry that gra- over for some players. Maybe the guys that graduated were the trash okay. talkers. So I, you know, I, I I wanted to see BYU dominate a little bit more, but I think it was a fair expectation. I mean, they won three sets to one. It's fine. Now, the standard's high, and that's why we're even asking this question. But, uh, yeah, I expect BYU to be a little better. Um, last year, BYU was dominant, like 17-1, and one, the one they lost in extras and five at number one at the time, Hawaii. So being number one is different than being number two this year. For On to the next. Which BYU team has the most to prove this weekend, Jaron, because we're lining up for a very busy weekend? It's probably men and women's hoops to continue to stay in the bracket. Men's volleyball, it's February. It's the end of the season, though, in basketball. Yeah, I mean, we're doing gymnastics tonight. BYU's ranked number 11. Uh, Tomorrow, BYU women's basketball against Portland. I think there's more riding on the line based on where they are in their individual seasons. Yeah, end of the season. And which buzzer beater is better, Shaylee Gonzalez last night or Alex Porcello against Utah Valley? So the Shaylee buzzer beater puts BYU up by four at the end of the third quarter, and that's from 35 feet, frankly, in a more important game. BYU was not going to be challenged by Utah Valley significantly. This is Gonzaga. This is a team that had won 17 games in a row, ranked number 16 in the country. So You're saying something against Gonzaga is better than something against Utah Valley? Yes. By context alone, it's clearly Shady Gonzalez. Yeah, totally. Gonzaga. Absolutely. The NCAA announces this morning that they will allow fans to NCAA tournament games. Whoa. Brigham, you hear that? Each venue, listen to this, can hold up to 25% capacity with social distancing. Of course, naturally. Jerem, should BYU at this point follow suit for next week's games? Look, look at me closely. <laughs> yes, of course. That wraps up the best of BYU Sports Nation this week. Tune in next Saturday for the Cougar news you need to hear. 
and catch the BYU Sports Nation simulcast every day at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific on BYU TV and BYU Radio. BYU.